Hello class! Today we're going to discuss muriological nihilism and cohabitation theory, two more proposed solutions to the puzzle of material constitution. Here's some study guide questions to help us get started. 1. What does muriological nihilism deny? 2. What is muriological nihilism specifically? 3. What is the motive behind muriological nihilism? 4. What is gunk? in the metaphysician's sense of the term. 5. What is the gunky objection to muriological nihilism? 6. What does cohabitation theory deny? 7. What is cohabitation theory specifically? 8. What is the similarity objection to cohabitation theory? All right. As I go through the answers to these questions, as always, you'll probably want to pause the video and write them down, type them up, crochet them into a sweater, or hammer them into an ice sculpture, however it is that you can best compartmentalize the information. So when we last left off, we had this puzzle, uh, the puzzle of material constitution. It's an inconsistent tetrad. That means that there are four assumptions, each of which seems plausible enough on its own, but together they disastrously entail a contradiction, and we're trying to find which of these assumptions is the one that we want to deny. Muriological nihilism is the view which denies the assumption that Sider calls existence. In other words, muriological nihilists deny that there are such things as statues or hunks of clay. And there's nothing special about either of those types of objects either. Muriological nihilists deny that there are any composite objects. So there are no statues or lumps of clay, but neither are there coffee mugs, hunks of ceramic, kittens, hunks of cat meat, Shoes, ships, sealing wax, cabbages, and kings. Muriological nihilists do not believe in any composite objects. In other words, they do not believe in any objects that have parts. Now, how do they get away with that? Let me tell you a story. I'd like you to imagine an expanse of absolutely empty space, nothing in it whatsoever, just a vast emptiness. And then, floating in that emptiness, are a bunch of perfectly round, chemically pure iron ball bearings. They're just floating around in space, chemically pure iron, all perfectly round, and they're floating about. I want you to imagine that sometimes the ball bearings cluster together, Sometimes they spread apart, they can be condensed and rarefied in various patterns. And let's ask the question, what would it take for there to be anything in this universe that you're imagining? What would it take for there to be anything more than just ball bearings? In other words, what must occur in order for there to not only be some ball bearings, but for there to be something else in that universe which is not just some ball bearings, but is made of them. Under which conditions could we have something that's more than just ball bearings, over and above the ball bearings? The muriological nihilist is the person who says nothing, never. No matter what happens in that universe, there's always just ball bearings and nothing else. Now when we look at our universe, the physical universe that we inhabit, it's not all that different from the one I just described. It's just that instead of little iron ball bearings, we've got atoms, or whatever the most tiny particle happens to be. Floating throughout space are all these tiny little particles. Sometimes they cluster together, sometimes they separate, they can be condensed and rarefied in various patterns. But what must occur for there to be anything more than just those particles? Is there anything that can happen that would make it the case that there's more than just particles in the universe? The nihilist says, no. According to muriological nihilism, the only things that exist are little bits that can't be divided down any further. There's just a sea of particles. That's all that the universe is. Sometimes those particles swirl around and they form certain shapes, but at no point, at no point, do they ever compose anything that's more than the sum of those particles? So the particles can swirl around and become arranged table-wise, or they can swirl around and become arranged statue-wise, or they can swirl around and become arranged cat-wise, 
but at no point will their activity ever result in there being anything like a table or a cat. That never happens. So for the Myriological Nihilist, there are no tables or chairs or cats or dogs or statues or coffee cups or anything more than just particles. There's just particles. Now, why does the Myriological Nihilist believe this? Well, first of all, the thesis itself is that there are no composite objects, only simple objects. That's what Myriological Nihilism says specifically, that there are no composite objects, there are only simple objects. Here the word composite means having parts, means being divisible. Simple, likewise, means having no parts. A simple thing cannot be divided in any way, a composite thing can. Now the reason why the Myriological Nihilist believes all this is that it allows them to deny the existence of anything that leads to the puzzle of material constitution. The puzzle of material constitution only arises when you have something that's made of something else, where the ability to take one of those things apart results in the problem of there appearing to be two separate entities. By denying the existence of all composite objects, the nihilist denies the existence of anything that could lead to this puzzle. That's their way of solving the puzzle. We don't have to worry about how there can be a statue and a stone, which are different things in the same place at the same time, because there are no statues and there are no stones. Despite its name, Myriological Nihilism, this comes from Meros, which means part, and Nihil meaning none, they don't believe in anything with parts, Myriological Nihilism is actually a rather old view. Some versions of it can be found in classical philosophy, both Western and Eastern. Certain Buddhist meditations, for instance, ruminate on the idea that there is nothing extended across space, that you might think that you have a whole cart, which is one thing, but actually the cart is just the handles and the box and the wheels. And then for each one of those things, you might think the box is one thing, but it's just four sides. And you might think that maybe one of those sides is a single thing, but it's actually just halves of things and quarters of things and smaller and smaller and smaller. Until you realize that what you thought was a cart isn't there at all. There's just a bunch of tiny little things arranged and nothing more than them. Certain metaphysically informed interpretations of Buddhism say that the key to releasing yourself from desire is to realize that the things that you desire, perhaps things like carts and statues, don't really exist. And that part of the path on enlightenment, I guess, is to solve the puzzle of material constitution in a very specific way, the nihilist way. Now, to object to myriological nihilism, you might just point at the ordinary objects whose existence they deny, and insist that their denial of them is so absurd that nihilism must be false. How dare they deny the existence of coffee cups? Why, I have one right here! And so on. Unfortunately, this type of objection does not take us very far. Instead, let's look at a more sophisticated objection to myriological nihilism, which does bedevil even its most sophisticated versions. Let's consider the idea of gunk. In professional, analytic, serious metaphysics, gunk is a technical term. It refers to infinitely divisible matter, matter that could be divided endlessly. To consider it, let's imagine that you have a cube of matter, let's say a little cube of tofu, and you divide that cube of tofu in half, that's fine, and you divide that half into halves, and then you divide that remaining portion into halves, and then half of that into halves, and so on and so on and so on. Eventually you come down to molecules, and eventually you come down to atoms, and eventually you come down to quarks, but if the matter that the tofu is made of is gunk, then you can keep going forever. You could divide into halves and further for millions of years. And still, within the smallest portion that you find, there would be a whole universe worth of complexity in there that you could carve into and carve out of, and you would never see the end of it. That is what gunk is, is infinitely divisible matter, 
bottomless matter, matter with no tiny ultimate constituents, no smallest bits. It's a neat idea, and present-day scientists do debate and consider whether the matter of our universe is in fact gunky, or whether the matter of our universe is atomic in the metaphysical sense. Now, the reason why gunk can pose a problem for mereological nihilism is this, that if mereological nihilism is true, then gunk is impossible. It could never exist. There just couldn't be such a thing as gunk. However, when we think about it, gunk is possible. Even if our universe doesn't happen to be gunky, it could have been. Even if matter does have a bottom level in our universe, it might not have. Our universe could have gone a different way. It could have gone a way where matter was infinitely divisible. There's certainly no contradiction in the idea. It's perfectly possible in that sense. So, there's this thing which is possible, but mereological nihilism entails that it's not possible. So much the worse for mereological nihilism. That's the way that the argument goes. Now, why think that mereological nihilism entails that gunk is impossible? Well, if mereological nihilism is true, then there cannot be any composite objects. And yet, if gunk exists, if a universe is made of gunk, then all objects are composite. Even if you cut matter in half again and again and again and a million times again, what you'll end up with is something that can be divided further, some little particle that has two halves. And then you can raise the puzzle of material constitution. Is the particle identical to the pair of its halves? Seems not. You could have the pair of the halves without the particle if only you split it, and thus the puzzle arises again. In order to distinguish a universe that has nothing at all in it from a universe that has gunk in it, the mereological nihilist would have to countenance the existence of some composite object, some portion of gunk that is composite. And this, by the definition of their view, they can't do. So, although a world full of gunk is clearly possible, we can clearly conceive of it, it makes sense, there's no contradiction in the idea, the mereological nihilist cannot admit that it's possible. So much the worse for mereological nihilism, goes the object. Now, moving along, we end up at our final assumption, the assumption of absurdity. The assumption which says that you cannot have two things in the same place at the same time. Now, the next theory we look at, cohabitation theory, is a theory that looks at that and says, ah, oh, heck, you know what? After discussing this puzzle for a while, it seems like we should just admit that we learned something. We walked into the puzzle thinking, you can't have two things at the same place at the same time. But once I hear all these cases about the coffee mug and the ceramic and the statue and the clay and the kitten and the cat meat, and once I think about that and I look at how silly the other attempts are to get out of this puzzle, we should probably just, you know, admit that you can have two things in the same place at the same time. We were wrong. Our intuition was wrong. You can have two things in the same place at once. The statue and the clay are two things in the same place at once. The kitten and the cat meat are two things in the same place at once. The coffee mug and the ceramic are two things in the same place at once, and so on. That's what cohabitation theory says. Cohabitation theory specifically says that you can have two things or more in exactly the same place at exactly the same time. That's the theory. What's wrong with that? Well, I'll tell you. Here's a principle that should seem pretty acceptable. That if two things, A and B, are exactly similar, then it makes no sense for A to survive something that B cannot. That should seem true. After all, if I have two things and they're exactly similar, they're made of the same material, they're the same color, they're the same size, the same shape, the same weight, the same internal complexity and structure, they're exactly the same in every occurrent way, except that this one cannot survive being thrown into a fire. That should seem absurd. And the reason why it should seem absurd is that we tend to explain what things can undergo in terms of their occurrent features, in terms of those features we can detect and see that are manifest in their appearance. If one thing can survive a fire, but another thing cannot, it seems like there should be a difference in how those things are. There should be a difference in their chemical composition, or in their size, or their shape, or something. If one of them cannot survive a fire, but the other one can, there should be a difference between them. However, 
If cohabitation theory is true, it's possible for two exactly similar things, A and B, to differ in what they can undergo. The statue cannot survive being squished, but the lump of clay can. And yet, the statue and the lump of clay, at least before the squishing, are as exactly alike as can be. They have the same shape, the same size, the same dimensions, the same internal complexity, the same chemical composition, even the same location. Exactly alike in every way, except that one of them can survive a good squishing and the other one cannot. Well, given our first principle, that's absurd and so much the worse for cohabitation theory. This is what we'll call the similarity objection to cohabitation theory. The similarity objection says that you can't have exactly similar things that are different in their persistence conditions, and yet this is what you have if cohabitation theory is true. So much the worse for cohabitation theory. So those are a couple more proposed solutions to the puzzle of material constitution, myriological nihilism and cohabitation theory, along with a couple of puzzles which threaten them, or a couple of objections. Next time, we're going to jump in and take a look at what Ted Sider's own proposed solution is, and this is a solution which has to do with a view of time as well as a view of material objects. Thanks for watching. See you soon.